I'm Robin Dunbar. I'm Professor of Evolutionary Psychology at the University of Oxford, and I'm a Fellow of the British Academy, the National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Well, I'd like to talk today about something that's near and dear to all of us, and that's the nature of friendship. What is it to be friends with someone? Why do we have friends? What do they do for us? In fact, I actually spent the first half of my research career studying the behaviour of monkeys in the wild in Africa. And I think anybody who spent any time at all studying the behaviour of uh, monkeys and apes comes away really impressed by the sheer complexity of their societies. They're much more complex than anything we see in uh, other mammals or even in birds. In addition to that, it's clear that the relationships they have with each other are something like what in humans we would refer to as friendships. So inevitably, perhaps, I eventually began to wonder how what I was observing in these monkeys translated across to our own species, to humans. Um, and so eventually I became interested in the nature of human friendships and the nature of human communities. But let me begin first by convincing you, if you need any convincing, uh, that friendships are good for you. And let me really give you the evidence for their health benefits, because these are really quite surprising and they've caught us left field completely. We didn't anticipate them. And it's only within the last 10 or 15 years that we've really known about them and realised how important they actually are. So it turns out that the single most important factor that predicts your psychological health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, even how long you live, is the number and quality of close friendships that you have. Now, you might suppose that that being so, uh, the more friends you have, the better. Up to a point, that is true. But there is no way you can have an infinite number of friends and therefore live forever. The number of friends we have uh, is really constrained by two key things. One is our psychological abilities to handle relationships and manage them. And the other is time. So let me explain. I became aware of the psychological or cognitive constraints on the number of relationships we can have many years ago when I was trying to understand what determined the size of monkey and ape social groups. And I discovered that uh, if you plot the size of typical size of a species social group against the size of its brain, you got a very nice relationship. Species that live in big social groups have big brains. And that's a reflection of the fact that uh, primate societies are very complex and therefore they need a very large computer, in other words, the brain, to handle and manage all the relationships involved. And that's because it's not that they're just dealing with relationship with somebody else, but also with that other individual's relationships with all the other members of the group. So it's trying to integrate uh, all the this spider's web, really, of uh, relationships between all the members of the, of the local group that causes the complexity and requires all this computing power. Now, this uh, relationship is generally known as the social brain hypothesis. And occurred to me that, well, we should be able to predict what the natural size of human groups are off the back of this, the equation for this relationship in primates. So when I did that, I came up with a predicted group size for humans of 150. This is the number now known as Dunbar's number. Well, it struck me at the time that this was implausibly small. I mean, surely humans, we live in these huge mega cities. You know, why is this number so small. But once I started to look for evidence on the size of communities in hunter-gatherers and the size of social networks, the number of friends and family we have as individuals, sure enough, there it was. It's 150. 
So there's a kind of cognitive limit on the number of people that we can maintain as friends and family, if you like, at any one time. But the other issue is the time we have to invest in those relationships to make them work in the way we want them to work. And the way we want them to work is for these people to come to our help when we need it, uh, to pick us up when we, our world falls apart and uh, put us back on the right path, as it were. And people's willingness to do that depends primarily on the time you invest in them. This is true both of monkeys and humans. So time is crucial. And if you look at how people invest their time in their different relationships within their 150 social world, what you find is you've actually got a series of layers where a very small inner core gets a very high proportion of your time and effort. It doesn't matter whether you measure that in face-to-face -face interactions or by how frequently you phone people or even how often you post named posts to them on, on something like Facebook. That inner core, and it numbers about five relationships, actually gets 40% of your total social effort. And then, in addition, uh, the next 10 people further out, making up a total uh, combined layer of, of 15 people, uh, the additional 10 people get another 20%. So those 15 people who are closest to you get 60% of your total social effort. And that is, these are the ones that really matter. That five, inner core of five are the ones that really uh, affect your health and well-being uh, and uh, longevity and so on. They are what I call the shoulders to cry on friends. They're the people who will drop everything to come to your aid when your world falls apart. The wider group of 15 are really the core of your social world. They buffer you against the general stresses of life and living in social groups. But the quality of our friendships within those uh, layers also depends on something else that is purely cultural. And this is because of a striking tendency for our friends to resemble us in all sorts of ways. Um, this is known as homophily, the love of the same, if you like. So birds of a feather, feather that flock together. Um, but it turns out that uh, we select our friends uh, and even our family members, our preferred family members, on the basis of how much we share in common with them. And what we share in common, we've come to call the seven pillars of friendship. So these are like seven dimensions, like a supermarket barcode on your forehead, of the things you like and dislike and who you are and where you come from and so on. And these seven pillars are sharing the same language or better still dialect, uh, having the same educational trajectory, uh, coming, growing up in the same uh, location, um, having the same hobbies and interests, having the same moral and political and religious views, um, having the same musical tastes, and last but not least, having the same sense of humour. And we, the strength of our friendships, put it this way, co correlates directly with the number of these dimensions that we share in common. But they're all substitutable, so three uh, three um, uh, uh, pillar friendship can have any three uh, of those seven uh, dimensions and uh, any th any three is as good as any other three it doesn't really matter but those what those seem to do is to point back to a small community particularly a, the small community in which we grew up but that's a kind of moving um, target if you like through the course of life because what's important about these uh, seven pillars is they are cultural primarily and they change through your life so they're a way of identifying the people whom you know and understand and feel closely engaged with. They're the people you can trust because you understand how they think. And these seven pillars are the kind of cues that allow you to identify in a very fast and furious way um, who belongs to your community and who doesn't. Interestingly enough, the combined uh, common musical taste turns out to be much the best predictor for uh, how likely a friendship will be with strangers. If you share the same musical taste, that suddenly makes you a band of brothers, as it were. Well, that's a little bit about the nature of friendship. And of course, friendship has been in very short supply, or at least the ways of uh, uh, interacting 
with our friends and family has been in very short supply thanks to COVID and lockdown. Uh, and we'll want to get out and, and renew those things. But one of the interesting things about friendships is actually they're incredibly dynamic. People are constantly changing place, changing layer in our, our friendship circles. And so we can expect that some of these relationships will have changed. Some will have dropped down to lower levels and new ones will have come in to replace us. And that's a perfectly normal feature of the nature of friendships.